SBS advises that the following program has been classified M for mature audiences. It contains violence and adult themes. Tiananmen Square, Beijing, the largest public space in the world, created on an inhuman scale. The monumental public buildings that line the edges and the vast treeless spaces in between speak of the insignificance of the individual before the might of the state. The atmosphere here is edgy. Even with permits and government minders, our filming is constantly interrupted. Soldiers, policemen, men in plain clothes, all demand our papers. The authorities here are afraid of cameras. They know their power. They have hundreds of them trained on Tiananmen Square. Their cameras. Cameras in other hands are considered dangerous, and with good reason. This place can be a powder keg. On a June night in 1989, Tiananmen Square was a war zone. The People's Liberation Army fought its way into Beijing from four directions with orders to converge on the square. Unarmed citizens and students faced armored personnel carriers, tanks, and soldiers armed with semi-automatic weapons. By 5.30 a.m. on June the 4th, 1989, the Army's mission had been accomplished. Gradually, the dawn came up. In Beijing, you know how misty it is, smoggy. This wasn't a sunrise. This was like a grayness gradually acquiring some sort of light. And where all this life had been was this quadrangle of tanks facing out. And I just stood there and I watched. T.D. Ullman was staying at this Beijing hotel, which has a commanding view of Shangan Avenue, the Avenue of Eternal Peace, that runs directly into Tiananmen Square. On these balconies, Western reporters and photographers had crouched, often under gunfire, to record the events of the night of June 3rd, 4th. Then, at noon on the 5th, when the army seemed in complete control, something remarkable happened on Shangan Avenue, immediately below. The tanks danced. It was obscene. It was like an obscene dance. They just didn't roll out. They swiveled around. God knows why they did that. And then the moment came which has intrigued you and fascinated and moved the world. You stand there, you're looking down, this tank's coming out, it's got its uh, gun up, and this man just went out and he said, stop. It's absolutely extraordinary. You could look at him as unusually brave, but he probably wasn't. He was probably just an ordinary person who was so disgusted at what he had seen for the last few days. And he said, right, that's it. I'm going out and I'm going to just stand in front of that column. The tank did not try to just run him over. It turned to go around him. And then the young man jumps in front of the tank. And then the tank turns the other way and the young man jumps the other side. They did this a couple of times and then the tank turned off its motor. And then it seemed to me that all the tanks turned off their motors because uh, it was really quiet. Standing in front of a column of tanks, no one around him. He was all on his own with his shopping bag in his hand. He climbed on top of the tank, banged on the lid, said, get out of my city. You're not wanted here. We don't know exactly what he said, but it's clear that's what he wanted to say. 
And I started to cry because I had seen so much shooting and so many people dying that I was sure this man would get crushed. So I remember thinking, I can't cry because I can't see. I want to watch this. During this time, I'm thinking, this guy is going to be killed any moment now. And if he is, I just can't miss this. This is something that he's giving his life for. It's my responsibility to record it as accurately as possible. And then after a while, the young man jumps down, and the tank turns on the motor, and the young man blocks him again. I thought, he's just going to get crushed. I realized that the, the Public Security Bureau had been watching us from the other rooftop by binoculars. So I went in and took the film out of the camera and reloaded it into the plastic film can and uh, went into the toilet, took off the top of the toilet and put it in the holding tank, put the toilet top back on. And shortly after that, probably 10, 15 minutes afterwards, the public broke through the door. They got one other roll of film from the, the shots that I'd taken from the night before. And they were pretty satisfied they they'd cleaned up the situation. About a day and a half later, I worked my way back through the back streets of the Beijing Hotel, and luckily nobody had flushed the toilet. So one of the most famous photographs of the 20th century was floating in the top of a ladder. Floating in the top of the toilet and possibly it could have been literally flushed, yeah. Images of that extraordinary confrontation became icons of freedom. They have been reproduced on T-shirts and posters ever since. President Bush commended his courage and leaders the world over hailed him. He became an inspiration to millions and he changed lives forever. For all my years conducting investigation of human rights abuses, I never forgot this young man who stand in front of tanks. It's not only me never forgot, the world did not forget him. I spent, you know, years in the labor camp. I confronted the regime also in the labor camp. That image actually played a key role to me. Within minutes of his incredible act of defiance, Tank Man was hustled away by whom we do not know and vanished. And for years, his fate and identity have remained a mystery. But what can we tell about him from these images? He didn't look at all like a student. He looked like someone on his way to work or who just knocked off and was on his way home doing the shopping on the way home. In a sense, he stood for the ordinary people. The protests that climaxed with the tank man's lonely act of defiance had begun five weeks earlier with a mass student demonstration. And in most Western media, continued to be treated as a student phenomenon. But there's much more to this story. The students had touched a nerve and soon everyone seemed to be out there protesting against hardship, government corruption and 40 years of repression. In Tiananmen Square and on the streets of Beijing, in cities right across China, there were tens of millions of tank men. Whole swathes of the country were in open revolt. In Beijing, one in ten of the population was joining in. And that includes all the old people, all the little children. So it was massive. It was just a carnival of protest. All the groups were out there with their own banners saying, we are the Beijing journalists, we demand press freedom. We demand the right to tell the truth. You had doctors and nurses and scientists and army people demonstrating. The Chinese Navy was demonstrating. And I thought, this is extraordinary, because who's left? 
<laughs> it's just the top leaders who aren't out there. And from cities across the country, hundreds of thousands of supporters converged on the capital. The students had started the protest, hoping to cleanse the party of graft and corruption and encourage free speech. They sought reform, not revolution. But as the movement spread outwards to the middle classes and then to the workers and peasants, attitudes hardened. The move from student uprising to a worker uprising is what really scared the Chinese government. They felt that they could deal with the students. After all, students had been involved in uprising for, for many, many years. But where it became dangerous to the stability and to the survival of the Communist Party was when ordinary workers became involved. May 20th, before an audience of party faithful, Premier Li Peng imposes martial law on Beijing. <laughs> Troops would occupy the city and put an end to the protests in Tiananmen Square. Never before in the 40-year history of communist rule had China put its citizens and its army in this situation. It was a massive display of force, 300,000 troops by mass counts, countless tanks, APCs, uh, the lot, all converging on the city from every quarter. The people just flooded out and physically, with their sheer numbers, simply blocked the road. The scene that greeted my eyes was just unbelievable. I could see for about a mile in the distance. Endless serried ranks of transport trucks, completely surrounded by tens of thousands of people. Young women, middle-aged housewives, elderly retired workers said, you're not coming in, sorry, this is our city. There's no chaos, leave us alone. So there are three or four major military convoys in the suburbs of Beijing that can't go forward to Tiananmen Square. They also can't withdraw. They had them fixed there and imposed on them a 24, 48 hour street seminar to explain to them why they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. <laughs> The citizens were also quite clever. They brought their children and asked them to say to the soldiers, How are you, Uncle Soldier? The soldiers were touched and they said, We won't kill our people. Four days after the attempted entry, the army withdrew to bases outside the city. Beijing was euphoric. So that ended very well and was a great triumph. But it also was an enormous humiliation for the leadership. They had been thwarted and they had lost face. Then they weren't going to let it happen again. Over the next 10 days, Supreme Leader Deng Xiaoping hatched a new plan. A huge force, spearheaded by tanks, was drawn from military districts across China. On the night of June 3rd, uh, a huge invasion force coming in again from all directions, but mostly from the west, this time with live ammunition. This time, strict orders, the square must be cleared by dawn on June 4th. The instructions to the troops said, we don't want bloodshed, avoid bloodshed. But the other instruction to the troop, which was ironclad, was the square has to be cleared by 6 a.m. To block the army's advance, the citizens barricaded all the main road bridges and intersections with buses, trucks, heavy earth-moving equipment, anything they could lay their hands on. Armored personnel carriers came, and they began to ram the buses. Somebody threw some type of gasoline-soaked rug into the buses, and the buses illuminated with fire. Then, sometime after 9.30, you had more soldiers out there, and live fire began. 
the first rounds of fire catch everybody by surprise. The people in the streets don't expect this to happen. They shot, you know, randomly toward all the sorts of direction. Angry citizens were everywhere. People just couldn't understand why this country and its army, the People's Army, would slaughter its own people, the Beijing citizens. People still pour into the streets. This is the amazing thing. People were just so angry, so furious at what was happening in their city that they were not going to step back and let the army do what it was doing. A young friend standing next to me shouted, Overthrow fascism! Then the soldiers started shooting at us. We immediately threw ourselves to the ground. Troops began to fire in all different directions. Many people, children, women, ordinary people, were shot standing on their balconies looking down at this uh, spectacle. They just raked the buildings with their gunfire, and they were shooting people. People were being killed on their, in their own kitchens. Everybody was frightened by this overwhelming use of force. Right in front of us, this tall young man, about 20 years old, suddenly fell down. He'd been shot in the chest. Blood was pouring out. We were absolutely shocked. We didn't know how to stop the bleeding. Someone found a bicycle to carry him to the hospital. I visited three hospitals, and we were in total shock because of the large numbers of people wounded being brought to these facilities, most of them being brought on bicycle-pulled carts, and all around us we could, we could hear gunfire. We went into the hospital through the back entrance where the staff goes. There was a smell. My friend said, you smell that? And I said, I smell something sweet, and she said, that's death. That's what you're smelling. People started to scream at us, Pai Dan Shur, Pai Dan Shur, take pictures, take video, tell the world what's going on. They're killing innocent people. Basically, it was a one-sided pitched battle all the way from the western suburbs, several miles through the city, until they finally, about 1.30 a.m., began to arrive at Tiananmen Square. This was the crunch time. You had the military coming in from the west with their tanks, we knew there were tanks coming from the south up Tiananmen Gate, and now on both sides of the square, you had hundreds if not thousands of soldiers. And then the firing started. <laughs> Even at this late stage, many of those in the square couldn't believe the army was using live ammunition and stood their ground. One man was shot down. Someone ran up and dragged that man. I didn't. I just kept running. On my left side, someone was hit in the neck. Everyone was running. People were running to the square, and they were running from the square. And people were racing to the square on bikes, racing out of the square on bikes. The ambulances started to go in. There was a lot of smoke. The lights were on on the square. And there was this continual announcement of, under the martial law regulations, no one should be on the street. If you stay on the street, you will be responsible for what happens to you. This sort of continual base beat sort of, of that evening was that these announcements. About 4.15 in the morning, suddenly, all the lights in the square went out. Pitch dark. This was very frightening. And then I heard these horrible, crushing sounds like, Tanks run over things, crushing, splinter sounds. After about ten minutes, the lights came on again. And at that point, we could see just a river of troops flowing out of the Great Hall of the People, and deploying the front of the monument to the people's heroes. A large group of students and citizens had made their last stand at the monument. They had witnessed the shooting and killing as the army swept through the square towards them, and many expected the same treatment themselves. But they were wrong. The soldiers held their fire and offered amnesty if they vacated the square at once. From my point of view, the important thing was to avoid more injury and death. 
So I made the decision to lead the students out of the square. Three thousand to five thousand students and citizens left the square by the southeast corner. I never forget those faces, the young, the young people's faces. They were walking out with their heads held high. They'd finessed their retreat from the square so well. They'd performed so bravely. And finally, they'd, they'd made the right decision. There would have been no point staying there. Everyone would have been killed. Later that morning, amazing things started to happen. People astonishingly started trying, holding hands, walking up the avenue, trying to re-enter the square in the face of these tanks. These people were frantic. They were nuts out of their minds. These were parents of students who had been in the square that night. These parents were running back and forth, and they were saying, want to go into the square looking for our children. And an officer came out with a loud hailer, and he said, I'm going to count to five, and then we're going to fire. Then all the people would realize that the, the guns were pointed at them, and they'd go running past the hotel. And then the soldiers would fire in their backs. I felt like I was watching some terrible opera. And a lot of people went down. 30, 40, 50 people are knocked down. Everybody else ran away. I'm lying in the grass thinking, this is the worst thing ever. This is hell. But the odd thing was that after a little while, like 40 minutes, an hour, people would gather their nerve again and crawl back to the corner and start screaming at the soldiers. And then the commander would eventually give another signal and the soldiers would raise their rifles again. And the people go, oh my God, and they'd run away and they'd shoot more in the backs. And this went on more than half a dozen times in the day. It was, to me, unbelievable. There then suddenly appeared, right there, an ambulance. And they rush in amongst all the people who were on the ground. And the soldiers open fire again and mow them down. The soldiers shot everybody. Doctors, nurses, rescuers. Everybody was being shot at. This was a real massacre. This was the targeting and the shooting down of totally nonviolent innocent civilians. No one knows for certain how many people died. The Chinese Red Cross initially reported 2,600 and immediately retracted under intense government pressure. The official figure is 241 dead, including 23 officers and soldiers, and 7,000 wounded. All we can be sure of is that by the third day, June the 5th, the army was in complete control. Beijing seemed utterly vanquished until an unknown young man made his astounding gesture of defiance. The symbolism of what he did was overwhelmingly clear. He spoke for the Beijing people. Before June 4th, you had millions of people all over China and the cities, up in the streets, peacefully demanding more rights, freedom, democracy, press freedom, end to corruption. After June 4th, what did you have? You had one man, one sacrificial figure almost, who took it on himself to speak for everyone else who had been silenced by that time. But what happened to that young man? The only clue comes in the last few seconds when he was hustled away by four men. Their identity is key. I feel very strongly that it was public security bureau people that got him. They were on the rooftops with binoculars and walkie-talkies and they were controlling the outer areas of the square as you would control any military operation the high ground. It seemed like they had snatched teams of people they were conducting 
down below. Even if it wasn't PSB, I seriously doubt he could have gotten past the net of security. Well, if it was the PSB who took him to one side, what would have been his fate? Well, I, I felt pretty strongly that, uh, that he was executed. We saw a lot of public executions put on Chinese TV shortly after that. And it was for people that had done far less offenses than embarrass the government in such a way. In the aftermath of the Beijing massacre, tens of thousands all across the country were arrested. Unknown numbers were executed. Some are still in prison today. China television portrayed these people as counter-revolutionaries, hooligans, and agents of foreign powers. But they never produced the young protester who had become the most powerful symbol of resistance to the regime. I don't think they had him, or they would have, at that stage, displayed him. I think that the people who took the tank man away were concerned people. If you've ever seen security people manhandle a Chinese citizen, they're really brutal. They twist your arm, they make you bend over, they punch you a few times, they kick you. So to me, I think he was helped to the side of the road. He wasn't being arrested. Now that raises the intriguing possibility that he's still alive. I think that he is. The fact that we have not heard from him since that amazing incident tells me he's still alive, he's still there, he has not been caught, and he's certainly not telling anybody that he's the man. If Tank Man has survived, where is he now? Since the day he made his heroic stand, his country has changed beyond recognition. Old economic dogmas have been cast aside in favor of raw capitalism. The results are dramatic. Since the Beijing massacre, the economy has grown at a staggering rate of 9% a year and is now the fourth largest in the world. Fifteen years ago, this entire skyline didn't exist, just paddy fields. China's rise is the story of the 21st century, and it is rooted in the events of 1989. This was Deng Xiaoping's great moment of genius after the massacre of 1989. What he basically said to people was, folks, you're in a room. There are two doors. One door says politics, one door says economics. You open the economic door, you're on your own, you can go the full distance, do basically whatever you want, get wealthy, help your family, have a bright future, move forward into a glorious future. You open the political door, you're going to run right into one obstruction after another, and you're going to run into the state. And for many of those who rose against the regime, principally city people, the deal has paid off. Never in the course of human history has a larger number of people gained more wealth in such a short time. Since 1989, China has seen the emergence of a new urban middle class estimated at over 200 million people. But that's only a fraction of China's population. There really seem to be two Chinas today. China A and China B. China A is big cities where businessmen and foreign governments go. Beijing, Guangzhou, Shanghai, Shenzhen, modern. And then you have China B, the undeveloped or developing China, which is the vast majority of the country. This China is still very poor, not getting better because all the economic growth is concentrated in the cities. It's a profoundly unequal system, and it's a system whose contradictions we see every day are playing out more and more. Yeah. 
It's a dizzying descent from the skyscrapers and freeways to this. And yet there have been changes here, real changes for the better. Under the old collective system, peasants were virtually slaves of the state. Now they own, or rather lease, their plots and are free to sell their produce on the open market. But what the state gave with one hand, it has taken away with the other. Education and health care have totally collapsed in the past 20 years. Education used to be free and accessible for every child in China. But now there is not one kid in China that doesn't have to pay to go to school. Something like less than a penny in American money per year in the rural areas is spent on health care. It's virtually gone. It's just not there. So if you get sick, you depend on local herbal remedies and folklore or die. There are almost a billion people in China B, including at least 750 million peasant farmers and their families. What's so striking here is not just the sense of timelessness, but the absence of young adults. You just can't make a living from farming here. You have to go away and find work. Everywhere you look in China, peasants on the move. Flow and counterflow of hundreds of millions of people willing to accept working conditions and wages that give this economy its competitive edge. It is the largest migration in history and the basis of China's industrial strength. Forty thousand migrants work here in Sanxinchang, a new industrial center that has grown from a village in less than ten years. The trend now is for specialization, one city per product. So China has a sock city, a toothbrush city, an underwear city, and here in Sanxinchang, a bedding city, making comforters, pillows, and sheets for the world. The Sanjin Chun employers have a preference for young female workers. Factory employers like to hire young people because they are more energetic. They are fresh. They can work faster. A lot of factories do not even have one day off. That means seven days a week, 13 hours a day. Typical pay for migrants working these hours, about $120 a month. They work them like this for maybe five, six or seven years. And then either they get sick, they get tired, and they leave on their own, or the factory management will fire them if they are not up to the speed. These other people are losers in the China's economic growth. And the population of them are vast, and they don't have a voice. They don't have a government ever listen to them at all. Migrant workers arriving at the site of the main stadium for the 2008 Beijing Olympics. It's highly unlikely, though, that any of them will be around to watch the games. Migrant workers are subject to strict residency laws. To remain in the cities, they must live without their dependents in single-sex hostels. When the job is done, they must find another or move on. Although there is no evidence of abuse on the Olympic sites, construction workers elsewhere have the worst deal of all under the present system. They go to a site and they work and work, and they're not paid at all. The arrangement is that you'll be paid at the end of the year. And if at the end of the year, either the boss, the, the, the construction company, or the gang boss default on you, 
That means you're not paid. And that is so common. There have been cases of construction workers trying to commit suicide, trying to draw attention by going up to some construction sites and threatening to throw themselves down. A lot of these construction workers are working for the state sector, building government buildings. And in the end, it's the workers who, who are at the, end, uh, at the bottom of the, you know, of the heap, and so they are not paid. What you see in China is this pool of resentments, this growing pool of resentments from the Chinese underclass that is progressively spreading over China. There's a huge amount of tension. It's like a land of a thousand earthquake faults. Time is running out. The level of unrest in China is rising. In 2005, there were 87,000 demonstrations. And those are the official figures. All over China, the pressure is building. Here, peasants defending their land from takeover by a power company are beaten, stabbed and shot by hired thugs. One incident in June of last year that happened to be recorded by a villager who was able to smuggle his tape out of the country. One incident in June 1989 that happened to take place under the very noses of Western cameramen. The challenge of powerful images for an authoritarian state is enormous. How do you stop one person's example becoming an inspiration to others? How do you prevent the fire from spreading? Beida, the University of Beijing and the most prestigious in all of China. In 1989, Beida was the nerve center of the student movement that would inspire a popular uprising. Largely the children of the elite, today's undergraduates enjoy all the benefits that have flowed into thriving China A. But what do they know of their recent history? I'm going to try a little experiment. Show this picture around and tell me what that picture says to you. Pass them around. They were baffled. After a long silence, one of them whispered, Looks like some military ceremony. The boy whispered back, 89. But the girl made no connection. Does it have any meaning at all? Well, I can see four vehicles. I'm not sure about the context. It might be a parade or something. I really don't know. I'm just guessing. I really can't tell anything from this picture. There's no context. Is this a piece of artwork? Did you make this up? Whatever they might have heard about 1989, it was clear that they had never seen the Tank Man picture. I think it's terribly tragic that Beijing University students who were at the forefront of the May 89 democracy movement, several generations of students later have no conception of what happened, don't even know that this incident of the man in front of the tanks ever happened. Any radio
regime attempting to combine economic freedom with rigid one-party rule is faced with a challenge. How do you allow in all the information necessary to keep a free market economy running while filtering out anything that contradicts the party line and undermines its authority? China has at least 35,000 internet police monitoring the country's 111 million internet users. For more sophisticated controls, China relies on Western technology. When we in the West search for images of Tiananmen Square on Google, photos of Tank Man pop up immediately. Move through the selection of 18 pages and Tank Man appears again and again. When people in China make the same entry on their Google search engine, they get just three pages, featuring maps, architecture, cooking hints, and smiling tourists posing in the square. But not one single image of the tank man. All the major IT companies in the West have not only embraced the Chinese market, they have bent over backwards to please the Chinese government. They have proposed to tailor their information system to fit the political censorship needs. Yahoo have very early on signed a self-censorship pledge. Google and others have followed. These companies are absolutely capable either of caving into the Chinese or worse, in the case of Yahoo and Cisco, just to take those two, of providing them with a technology to identify people and messages that the Chinese don't like. And we already know that at least one person, a person called Shi Tao, has been arrested in China because of this. Shi Tao was a journalist. His crime? Forwarding to a New York website Chinese government instructions on how their media should cover the 16th anniversary of the Beijing massacre. Yahoo supplied all the necessary information to the Chinese government including the time the email was sent, the IP address, and the corresponding PC he used. Shi Tao was arrested and put in jail for 10 years. In February 2006, representatives of Yahoo, Google, Cisco, and Microsoft appeared before a congressional committee accused of being accomplices of oppression. Leading U.S. companies like Google, Yahoo, Cisco, and Microsoft have compromised both the integrity of their product and their duties as responsible corporate citizens. We have determined that we can do the most for our users and do more to expand access to information if we accept the censorship restrictions required by Chinese law. If this Congress wanted to learn how to censor, we go to you. That the company that, that should symbolize the greatest freedom of information in the history of man. This was not something that we did enthusiastically or not something that we're proud of at all. No one had tougher questions to answer than Yahoo. Women and men are going to the gulag and being tortured as a direct result of information handed over to Chinese officials. When Yahoo China in Beijing was required to provide information about a user who we later learned was Xi Tao, we had no information about the identity of the user or the nature of the investigation. At the time the demand was made for information in this case, Yahoo China was legally obligated to comply with the requirements of Chinese law enforcement. My response to that is, if the secret police a half century ago asked where Anne Frank was hiding, would the correct answer be to hand over the information in order to comply with local laws? It is that aspect, direct cooperation between Western corporations and the Chinese police that is of greatest concern. China have a national program, so-called Golden Share Program. It means try to upgrade and modernize the police control system. Posing as a provider of surveillance technology and database management, exiled dissident Harry Wu contacted local police authorities across China. 
He says that time after time he was told he was too late. They already had the latest technology from the American corporation Cisco. Cisco signed a contract with the provincial security department one after the other one. In their proposal, they say very clear that we are help you make your work more effective. Patrol car to patrol car connection, patrol car to police station connection, include the voice identification, the image identification, the fingerprints identification, the training Chinese police, police to control the country, control the people. Cisco declined an interview, but issued a written statement. Cisco sells identical products worldwide. It is the customer, not Cisco, who determines how the specific capabilities will be used. Under pressure from Harry Wu and Congress, the administration and the State Department are now re-examining the rules under which technology companies should operate in China. But the technology is already there. It has helped make Tank Man disappear, and if another should step forward, that technology would facilitate a swift arrest. This lone defiance was an enigma, and the world's press wanted a name for the hero. After three weeks of speculation, news broke. He was named in an English Sunday newspaper as Wang Wei Lin, the 19-year-old son of a Beijing factory worker. Reporting from London, journalist Alfred Lee claimed that friends of the young man say they have spotted him shaven-headed and paraded on state television. Following his world exclusive, Alfred Lee was congratulated by British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, and the name he gave the tank man has been used by journalists and commentators ever since. I published the name Wang Wei Lin after speaking to three excellent contacts that I had in Beijing. These contacts were very close to what was happening in Tiananmen Square at the time. I didn't believe it <laughs> because, you know, it's great to have a scoop, but if no one can follow it, if no one can match it, then it doesn't exist. None of the resident correspondents in Beijing, many of whom are fluent in Chinese and have many sources, many connections, all kinds of information, no one could match it. I also took into account that the journalist who, rep who reported the story was not a resident foreign correspondent in Beijing. Five days after Alfred Lee's story broke, the London Evening Standard cited American intelligence reports confirming that 19-year-old Wang Weilin was dead. The article was attributed to the Standard's Beijing correspondent, John Passmore. Do you recall that article? Uh, not at all. And now you tell me that it was American intelligence sources. I know it couldn't have been me writing it because I didn't have any American intelligence sources. I, I had uh, British diplomats who helped me, but uh, not Americans. So y you don't have any evidence no. that he was executed? No, I never knew who he was or what happened to him. I mean, is that usual? Because it's your name there. Is it usual oh, yes. that um, reports are attributed to a journalist but actually wasn't written by him? Oh, absolutely. It looks so much better if you've got a man out in Beijing and he's written this report. But the report may have come from anywhere. Sometimes it's done out there, sometimes it's done in the office. I um, followed the paper trail of the reports that appeared in the Western press naming him as Wang Wei Lin. The reports that he'd been executed, I looked into these and I just concluded at the end of that investigation that we actually had no idea what this man was called, what his real name was, and we had even less idea of what had happened to him. He'd simply disappeared. There's been only one crack in the wall of silence. In 1990, Jiang Zemin, the man who would soon be president of China, was asked point blank by Barbara Walters. What happened to the young man? I think this young man will be not killed by the tank. No, but did you arrest him? We heard he was arrested and executed. Uh, well, I can't confirm whether this young man you mentioned was arrested or not. 
You do not know what happened to him. But I think never, never cured. Ne you think he was ne never I cured. think never cured. Never cured. Mm -hmm. This was the last official statement ever made on the subject. Every year at an anniversary, I got phone calls, I have interviews requests, I have journalists, I have teachers, I have students asking me, asking my organization, where is him? Who is him? How is him now? But until now, today, I don't have an answer. For over a year, we also followed every lead speaking to anyone who claimed to know the young man's name or his fate until like those who had followed the trail before us we came to understand that it is the mystery that gives the tank man his enduring power he didn't need to have a name he spoke for the masses the the, the many who'd been silenced in june 4th he was all of them he didn't need a name he still doesn't need a name because the point he made, everyone got it, everyone heard it, it will endure. The power of that story is not getting weaker because of the time, because we don't know who he is. It's actually getting stronger. That ultimate spirit of a freedom will last longer than the strength of tanks and machine guns. In the long frame of history, it's the human freedom, courage, dignity will stay and prevail. That picture will testify that forever. <laughs>